just in a nutshell, it is the title, Amazing Disciples. We want to create amazing disciples. We want people to be able to fulfill the divine commission that Jesus gave to his disciples before he went to heaven. And so we're just excited that you all are joining us right now. And a highlight of the online course is what we're doing right now. Uh, from time to time, we will do this where we will do a special Q&A session where we take the students' questions and we will answer them. And we're going to mm -hmm. answer as many as we can. So if we don't answer your particular question, just uh, keep submitting them because we're going to do this again. Mm -hmm. And we're just so excited about the program because, like I said, we've only been going now for a little over um, four weeks. We actually are starting week five tonight is when the curriculum for week five opens up. And we have almost 600 students Amen. now. And what's so cool to me about this whole thing is that our students are literally all over the world. For example, we have students in the Philippines, all over the United States, uh, South America, Canada, England, Japan, and it's it just all over. And so I'm just so blessed to be a part of the program. And you might be wondering, well, is it too late? Can I join? Or, you know, what, what's the protocol? Well, the good thing about it is we don't have a cutoff date, mm -hmm. so you can still enroll. If you want to learn more, you can go to afco.org, and you can learn about the program and still enroll. Uh, it's all the live content that we do is going to be archived, so you can go back and watch that anytime you like. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do now is uh, introduce our panel. We have with us uh, Pastor Jean Ross here. He's the Vice President of uh, Evangelism at Amazing Facts. And then, of course, we have Pastor Doug Batchelor, our president and speaker for Amazing Facts, and Pastor Marshall McKenzie, and I am uh, Daniel Hudgens. I am one of the AFCO online instructors. And uh, Pastor Doug, uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and why don't you just uh, share a little bit on uh, what's on your heart about being a disciple and soul winning and evangelism. Amen. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity where we can speak to so many people around the world where they can learn how to be disciples. And so, Lord, we ask for your wisdom now as we uh, take questions. We ask that your Holy Spirit would give answers that would help each individual. And we ask that you would continue to lead and guide this program and that you would touch many hearts as a result. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And thank you, Daniel. He's doing such a great job in helping to shepherd the whole AFCO online program. You know, I, I just thought I'd share something uh, very short with you, actually. Uh, one of my favorite verses, it's at the end of the prophecy in Ezekiel. And it says in Ezekiel 47, verse 9, he's describing the new earth and the new layout for God's people in the new kingdom. Talks about the river that flows from the temple, which you also find mentioned in Revelation. And it says, and it shall be that everything that moves wherever the river goes will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed. And everything will live wherever the river goes. Now he's talking about waters that flow from the temple down towards the Dead Sea. And of course nothing's alive down there right now. But uh, when they come from God, it says, everything will live wherever the river goes. You've probably heard stories about a river of life. The land of Israel is very interesting in that there are two opposite bodies of water. In the north, you've got the Sea of Galilee. Um, and then in the south, you've got the Dead Sea. Usually, you've got uh, many rivers that one run into one ocean, but in Israel, you've got one river that runs into multiple oceans. The Jordan River supplies the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River supplies the Dead Sea. And yet, they're so different. The Sea of Galilee is full of life. They've been fishing it for thousands of years, and we were there a few weeks ago, and they're still fishing the Sea of Galilee. I don't know how they do it, but they keep pulling fish out. And the Dead Sea doesn't have a, a mosquito larvae. It doesn't have a polywog. As its name implies, it's dead. There's nothing in it. Fascinating thing is both seas are fed by the same river. The difference between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is that the Jordan River runs out of the Sea of Galilee, but nothing runs out of the Dead Sea. 
The Dead Sea is always taking, but it never gives, and it's dead. Because the Sea of Galilee is giving, it's receiving the Jordan from the north, but it gives the Jordan to the south. It's alive because there's a flow. In the Christian life, if you just receive and you don't share what you receive, you die, you dry up. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as an inactive Christian because either your uh, secrecy will destroy your Christianity or your Christianity will destroy your secrecy. Mm -hmm. uh, Christians only stay alive like a muscle through use. And so the whole reason we do the evangelism training program is because God's called not just pastors and evangelists and teachers, but every believer is to use their gifts in discipleship. Uh, Jesus' great commission is to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And that's a, not a command just given to the 12 apostles, but that's a command given to every believer. And that's what this program is about. And he goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and so we're to be teaching. And so part of that is why we do these Bible answer sessions. And we're going to launch. We haven't rehearsed this. Matter of fact, we don't even know among the four of us who's going to answer which questions yet. So this should be interesting. <laughs> and again, want to welcome those who are our studio audience here in Granite Bay. And uh, those we know that there's a number watching online. And uh, with that, I don't know, Brother Daniel, wh when do we start with the questions? You well, have something else I'm going to gonna claim this verse for us. All and right. then we're just going to dive into the questions. So the, the verse that I want to claim for all of us here and for all of you watching is uh, coming from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Mm -hmm. So we want to try to answer as many as we can, and the result of that, hopefully, is for you to be able to answer the questions that come to you and follow Peter's counsel here. So with that said, and with that verse claimed, let's dive in and look at our first question. And whoever, whoever wants it, just take it, and then we'll all kind of go around. Uh, the question is, do prophecy seminars still produce results? I would simply say yes. Um, you know, if it weren't for the prophecy seminars, many times people really don't make final decisions. And so I found that prophecy seminars really help people kind of galvanize the decision. You know, they've thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And finally, you know, through a series, they make that decision um, that they've been looking forward to making. I remember doing a, a series of evangelistic series, and there was a gentleman that had gone to four in a row. And it just happened to be the one that I was giving that he finally made that full decision. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, there's no doubt. They still work. Still a blessing. I'm reminded of the counsel that Paul gave Timothy, sort of these final charge that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy was sort of a, almost a, a, a spiritual son to Paul. But the counsel, I think, is relevant for us today. It's preach the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Preach the word. There is power in the preaching of the word. Uh, you read about it in the New Testament, it's even framed as the foolishness of preaching. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not that the message is foolish, but the means might seem a little yeah. strange, and yet it is powerful because that's God's chosen means of bringing the gospel to the world. So we can't neglect public evangelism. Right. And we'll probably touch on a few other important aspects of preaching and teaching as we get through the questions, but without a doubt, public evangelistic meetings is still God's chosen means of reaching people in these last days. Amen. Now, I, I might just add to that, uh, amen, to what you said. <laughs> but um, part of what we do at AFCO is teaching people how to have a successful evangelistic program. Uh, I could tell you how to have a failure, too. So to say that every prophecy seminar is going to, you know, ha have out of this world results, that depends on a number of factors. Is it prepared well, the, the groundwork? Is the advertising well? Have the members been taught to be friendly to the visitors? And so there's a lot of factors, but does it work when it's done right? Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, I would just say one thing. Um, me, myself, I am the product of a prophecy seminar. Amen. And back in the early 2000s, we had a, an amazing facts evangelist come to my small town, and he did, you know, the long series. I attended every night, and here I am today. So uh, proof is in the pudding, as they say. Amen. So, um, and, and one great thing about prophecy is that uh, if it's centered in Christ, Jesus said in John 14, 29, 
And now I have told you before it comes to pass so that it, when it does come, you might believe. And I mm -hmm. think that's the whole big picture mm -hmm. of a prophecy seminar is showing that, hey, all this is not a fairy tale. It can be trusted. And this is a reality. And so um, they, they still work, like you said, if they're done right. <laughs> okay, so our, our next question. Does the 2300 days from Daniel have anything to do with the two witnesses? That's ostensibly the two witnesses in Revelation 11. Yes. <laughs> now, of course, you have two very important prophecies. Daniel 8.14 and the 2300 days. Then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And I think that's what he's talking about when he says the 2300 days. And the two witnesses you find in Revelation chapter 11. And the two witnesses are tied to another time period that you find in the book of Revelation. Uh, it talks about three and a half years or 1260 days or 1260 years. And um, it refers to the time period during the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages when the Word of God was to some degree um, prophesying in sackcloth, as you read about in Revelation chapter 11, meaning that the Word of God was suppressed, it was outlawed in some countries where people didn't have access to the Bible. But as that 1260 years of papal supremacy began to wane, which leads up to the fulfillment of the 2300 years, in 1844, you find the two witnesses in the late 1700s, early 18, 1800s, the Word of God is now released, so to speak, and they prophesy, and there's a great revival and reformation that takes place, not only in Europe, but in North America, in far-flung mission stations around the world, and the emphasis of the message at the time dealt with prophecy. So we do see an interesting connection between 2300 days and their fulfillment as well as the end of the 1260 year time period the two witnesses being the word of God the law and the prophets the old and the new testament it all comes together in bible prophecy so Amen. there seems to be a connection man makes me think of Isaiah 48 that says the grass withereth the flower fadeth but the word of God shall stand forever mm -hmm. in that those two witnesses how they were it was attempted to blot them out but they were not mm -hmm. able to do that so Praise the Lord for that. Uh, the next question we have is, will there be a seven-year tribulation, and where does this teaching come from? There's no, no specific verse in the Bible that says there will be a seven-year tribulation. Some have speculated from a couple things. One, that there was seven days from the time that Noah and his family entered the ark until the flood came. And others have taken the last week of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 uh, and they take it off of the complete 490 year prophecy and sort of detach it and have it floating at the end of time and they say that is that uh, one, it's seven years of tribulation and in the midst of the week they say the one who causes the sacrifice to cease is the Antichrist. Mm. But it was Christ's death on the cross that caused the veil to rent in the temple that put an end to the uh, earthly sacrifices. So it's a very unique um, extrapolation of those verses, but there's no specific place that says there'll be seven years of tribulation okay. other than Joseph's dream, seven years of mm -hmm. famine. <laughs> yeah. So, Okay. Just to add just a little bit more about that, it's uh, kind of interesting. The Bible does talk about a tribulation. Daniel 12 mm -hmm. verse 1, it says that time Michael stands up and there's a terrible time of trouble. But the whole idea of it being seven years is really a misinterpretation, as Pastor Doug said, of that last week of prophecy. And it's interesting that the devil would take a prophecy that points to Jesus and the fulfillment of all the sacrifice in the Old Testament at the time of Christ's death and somehow twist that into being the Antichrist power at the end of time, causing a lot of confusion in the minds of Christians even today as to this tribulation and the Antichrist, who is the Antichrist power. So. It shouldn't surprise us the devil is trying to misinterpret Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. He's been doing that for a while. That's right. I, you know, I appreciate the fact that there's going to be a tribulation, but that God gets us through the tribulation, though it's not defined in terms of years mm -hmm. or days, but we just know there will be. And he tells us in Psalm 91, 7, A thousand shall fall at thy, sa at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. So that's very mm -hmm. comforting too. Mm -hmm. Even though there will be a tribulation, we don't know how long it's going to be. God is going to be with us every step of the way. Amen. So. Okay, our next question that we have is, please explain to me about the Trinity 
in a way a new Christian would understand it easily. Are we supposed to do this as a short answer? <laughs> you can take, take as long as you want. He's, um, this comes from our student, uh, La Wa. So if you're watching uh, La Wa, welcome. And he's asking, uh, how can we do it simply? He, he has our new book, and he's just wanting to share it to his congregation. I believe he's going to speak on it soon. So he's wanting to know, how can he do it in a simple manner? Well, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a who. God is uh, the entity of what he is, and then you have the persons of God. There is one God, that one God, it, it's a thing. It's like you can say there's one family. Well, that doesn't mean one individual. And keep in mind in the Bible, the way they looked at numbers is very different. Jesus said to the 12 apostles, he prayed actually in John 17, Father, I pray that they may be one. Well, there are still 12. Uh, he says, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They become one flesh. God, the Father, Son, and Spirit are one God. That's why Moses said in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So, um, it, you know, it's hard to pretend that you have an easy answer to explain God because it says, as the heavens are high above the earth, so are his ways above our ways. So it is a deep question. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to share, um, kind of coming off of that, somebody shared with me one time, you know, there's basic math and there's advanced math. Um, you have one plus one plus one equals three, but one times one times one equals one. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like you were saying, it's an advanced uh, issue that's beyond us, yet God has still given us, you know, uh, some explanations of this reciprocal love relationship that we find in Scripture. Uh, thinking of what you were saying, um, John chapter 16, verse 13, 14, and 15. Um, I like how this is read, how John writes this. He says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative. And I like that. He, he's, he's choosing, but it's not on His own initiative. Mm -hmm. he, it's in accordance with this relationship. Uh, that we find throughout Scripture. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And then Jesus says, He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you, and all things that the Father has are mine. So you see this, this unique relationship, uh, but yet it's advanced math, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're going to be learning about this, I believe, throughout eternity. Therefore, I said, He takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So Amen. Yeah. you see that relationship. Kind of like, kind of like you were saying, Pastor Doug. That when I think of the Trinity, uh, the Bible gives us a good definition for God in First John four eight. It says, "For he that uh, loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love, mm -hmm. and for love to be expressed in the most adequate way, it's usually uh, the best way is with three. Now, if you get married and you're with your spouse, you know you can love your spouse. Your spouse can love you. But when you introduce that child, that number three in the relationship. Then you have to share that love, and I think that's kind of a beautiful and simple way to look at it, is that uh, God is like a family. Now, I'm not saying that one of them is a woman, mm -hmm. I'm, but they are a family uh, in a sense, you know. And, and just another verse, kind of like you were saying how God is past finding out, Genesis 1-1 says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there you find the very fabric of our reality, time, space, and matter. We live in time, space, and matter, but God created time, space, and matter, so he's kind of outside of time, space, and matter, so I don't even understand that. So it is holy and sacred ground, and it is hard to understand, but I think those are some good principles that we can take away right. from it. So our next question now is, can you please advise how to share the gospel to an atheist or to an agnostic person? Well, I think, first of all, you, you need to start with common ground. And uh, I, I think what we want to do, first and foremost, is help folks recognize that there's something special about the Bible. Because mm -hmm. if people can see value in the Scriptures, the Bible is not just a fairy tale, it's true, it's trustworthy, then they might be willing to at least entertain the idea of a God described in the Bible. So that's where I think Bible prophecy is so important. And the Bible's full with prophecy. And Jesus said, you know, I'll tell you things to come that when they come to pass, you might know that what is being shared, I'm paraphrasing, is true. 
So when you look at the prophecies of the Bible, I just take a simple one like Daniel chapter 2, where you have the empires, and it describes all of these empires that would rule the world right up till today, and you walk through that prophecy with somebody else, and they see how accurate the Bible is, and Daniel was written way before Jesus, maybe there is something special about this book. And if you can build that common ground, then from the scriptures you get a clear understanding of who Jesus is. So uh, I think that's why we have prophecy in the Bible, to help us Amen. to share with people. Uh, that's one aspect that you can, you can approach. Another one is to recognize, you know, the Bible says the Holy Spirit speaks to all hearts. So each person has a, a longing or a need or a desire. Uh, that's why Paul was speaking to the Athenians and said, you've got an altar yet to the unknown God. There, there is a, uh, something within us that we feel there must be more. There must be a God out there. We have questions. Why am I here? Where am I going? And trying to address those common questions that people have, again, directing them to the scriptures as the foundation of truth. Mm -hmm. And it takes time, yeah. little by little, yeah. kind of building people, their faith in the Bible and in the God of the Bible. You know, coming back to what you're talking about, about prophecy, you know, there's many cities that have been rebuilt after they've been destroyed. Yet you read in Scripture, there's certain prophecies of certain cities that God said would never be rebuilt. Why haven't they been rebuilt like these other cities? All they would have to do is rebuild them to disprove the prophecy. So it's, you know, and, and there's a, a little book uh, called David Dare. It's an old little book, but I would recommend it highly. It's an evangelist who specifically was working with atheists. And it's very interesting how he goes through the prophecies and, and identifies some of some of these things um, to them that, you know, that exist, but we never really stop to think about mm -hmm. um, in the process. The other thing is, is I really like um, first John chapter one, verse one. It comes back to the second part. Um, talking about John the Baptist in verse seven, it says about John, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Uh, the New King James would say he came for a witness to bear witness mm. um, so that people would believe. Uh, I think it's important that sometimes it's not just all about what we say, but it's who we really are. And I think that speaks volumes to people because they may not be able to hear you, but they can even see you from a distance. Mm -hmm. and, and that longing, then God is able to take you and kind of match it up with that longing and give you opportunities. You know, it's interesting. We're starting week five tonight. The curriculum for week five is, is being unlocked for the students, and the title is Friendship Evangelism. And I think they'll get some, some great, you know, tactics, methods that they can learn with friendship evangelism. Sometimes, um, like you said, you know, it takes time. Um, I've studied with atheists before, and what I've found is we have to figure out the root of their atheism. You know, some of them aren't really atheists. They're just m more mad at God than denying God and so if we can find out why they're mad at God and that's why I appreciate the Bible so much because it gives us one of their biggest complaints or the ones that I've studied with anyway is why is there evil in the world mm -hmm. and when you have a good biblical answer for that that can really help mm -hmm. and just be patient show them love and uh, you know the Lord will work it out and he'll touch their heart because we have to remember they're they're his children too and he loves them and he wants to reach them too so Can I do a little bit of shameless promotion? Oh, you know, I was going to do it and I forgot. I'm glad. I'm glad you are. I didn't know you were going <laughs> to. I don't know if we're promoting the same thing or not. I bet you we are. Go ahead. Amazing Facts has just finished a three and a half years. <laughs> it's prophetic right there. Uh, three and a half years of production. <laughs> time of trouble, yeah. Uh, of a new DVD that's called Kingdoms in Time, History's Greatest Prophecies. And it, it's something you could give to an atheist or agnostic that shows how these prophecies, the major prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled. And I think if, if any honest person looks at that, they're going to say, wow, the Bible is a supernatural book. And then they'd be open to Bible study because you've got to start with common ground when you're reaching these people. That's right. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, if we're going to study the Bible, a lot of the students are wanting to know what Bible software or apps do you recommend? And they've heard you guys talk about it on Bible Answers Live and they can't remember what software you guys use, and so this is a, a hot one. They want me to get back with them 
and give them all the software and the apps. So, so well, let's there's, a, there's a lot of good free. Well, of course, use the new Amazing Facts app. Just came out. Oh, we, yeah. we just updated our app. That's not quite Bible software, but there's a lot of good Bible study material. Right. Um, I, I've been using for several years one of the uh, premier Bible programs, but it's not cheap, and that's called Logos. Some call it Logos, Logos. Um, Pastor Ross and I sent, there's a free program called eSword. eSword, yeah. that's right. So now, of course, you can go with the Logos or Logos software, but that, that's very pricey. But you can get a number of the tools in the Super Deluxe Bible Software program for free online through something called eSword. And I believe it's available for PC and Mac, and it's got all of the old commentaries. Now, maybe you want to say something about when you get a good Bible software, it'll typically have some commentaries on the different verses. What we encourage folks to do is, especially some of the older commentaries like Matthew Henry, Clark, the, these are, are good historical commentaries on the Bible and they're worth looking at. You'll be able to glean a number of uh, wonderful gems of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the newer commentaries are good, but you just got to be careful when it comes to the interpretation of prophecy. Sometimes they lean more to a futuristic interpretation, so you need to be wise as you study through it. But finding a good resource that you could use as your study just helps to bring the Bible alive. Yeah. On my phone, I also use, a, I've got four or five different um, Bible softwares on my phone, apps. Another one is called Olive Tree. It's just, if you want a simple, yep. quick Bible yep. reading program. Uh, the eSword, by the way, I think it's E-Sword. That's right. Is, is how you yep. type that in. I have eSword X right here. And then uh, one that I really like, and it's, it's only like $10, is, and it's been very helpful for me. It's called Strong's Concordance app, where it is, it's the entire Bible, and you can just click on any word. You want to see the Greek or the Hebrew word, you just click on it, and it gives you not only the Greek or the Hebrew word, but it gives you every other place in the Bible that that word is, and it gives you the verse, and you can just click away and just go all through the Bible looking for that one word. And it's very helpful. There's a free version. It's called Strong's Bible, and you can get that on your mobile device, the Strong's Concordance uh, you can get that on your iPad or your um, computer. So those are some of the good ones. So that I don't know if you have any no. other. You're not required every time. <laughs> 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 All right. Can you give advice now on Bible versions? And uh, some of the students are asking, why does Amazing Facts use the New King James Version versus the King James Version? Well, the Amazing Facts uses, first of all, Amazing Facts doesn't dictate that our evangelists all have to use a certain version. Um, typically, I, I, for years I've used the King James Version. We gave out Bibles during our meetings and it was a King James Version. Um, I, right now I've got a new King James Version. Uh, when I go to sleep, I often listen to the King James Version on tape. Um, and so I've kind of memorized Alexander Scorby's pronunciation so I might even be reading, I might have the New King James open, but I've memorized it from the King James, so I'll substitute. I do my own bachelor version <laughs> as I read. But uh, in tri Bible translations, you want to get a good translation, not a paraphrase for study, that is based on the Textus Receptus, and in my opinion, some of the best for that, of course, King James, New King James, American Standard Version, and I don't know if you guys want to add to that or... I think it's important to realize or remember when you study the Bible that the Bible was not written in English or Spanish. It was written in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic in the book of Daniel, and then of course Greek for the New Testament. So it is valuable if you're really going to do a deep doctrinal study to have a resource that can take you back to the original language. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the Strong's Concordance. You can actually see where that original Greek word was used in the rest of the New Testament. So you can really get the context of it if you're doing some deep study. So you want to have a trustworthy translation. The difference between a paraphrase and a translation is paraphrase is somebody maybe taking an English version like the King James or the New King James and writing the verses um, in a different way. And they might add more of a devotional. More conversational. Yeah, kind of conversational, yeah. easy reading. And uh, you know, there are some good paraphrases out there but I would always double check with a translation. If you have a question on something, go back to the translation. And if you still have a question, go back to the original text and make sure that you, you have solid biblical uh, material when you're making doctrinal truth, when you're discovering Bible doctrine. Yeah. That's where the Strong's Concordance that we were talking about a little bit earlier mm -hmm. really is helpful. And going back and looking at the literal 
versus just a thought version. Amen. Oh, maybe one other quick thing. Sorry. On Bible translations, Pastor Doug mentioned Texas Receptus. Uh, there are two families of original Greek manuscripts. Typically today, the Old Testament is not much uh, in dispute because you have the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Hebrew is pretty much established. But there is some discussion uh, with reference to New Testament uh, manuscripts. As you know, they w there's not one New Testament Greek manuscript that was found, but the New Testament is comprised of different Greek manuscripts of different books. So there might be multiple manuscripts on the book of Matthew, for example. And in the early centuries of the Christian church, the two centers of Christianity that began to emerge was more in the Byzantine Empire versus Alexandria. So eventually they became two families of original Greek manuscripts. They call it the Byzantine manuscripts and the Alexandrian manuscripts. And um, the Byzantine manuscripts actually have a little more information in some cases than the Alexandrian manuscripts. So some of the newer translations are based more on the Alexandrian manuscripts, and there's actually some verses in the newer translations that are missing with reference to the Byzantine family. And so that goes back to those original families of manuscripts, whereas King James, New King James, they base more on the Byzantine family of text, and that's where the Textus Receptus really was compiled from. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. If someone believes the truth and dies before they are able to be baptized, will they be saved? Well, maybe the only way the thief on the cross will be saved, he accepted Jesus, but there's no record he was baptized before. That, of course, is Luke 24. Yeah. It's 23 or 24, I forget. <laughs> and, um, but uh, he's saved based on faith, not uh, on his baptism. I think Jesus gives people credit for his own baptism. See, Christ wasn't baptized for his sin. Of course, Jesus didn't die for his sin either. He died for ours. And so for those who can't be baptized, I think Christ would give them credit for his baptism. You know, I think uh, building off of that, when Jesus said to John the Baptist, it's important that we fulfill all righteousness, you know, in being baptized. And if, and if we're to put on his righteousness by faith, then if we don't have that opportunity, it's that's his righteousness mm -hmm. that we're that we're robed with now of course we're talking about evangelism it's important for us to recognize that uh, if someone is convicted for the truth and they realize the need to publicly confess their faith in Jesus and be baptized and yet they refuse to be baptized well then that raises a whole bunch of other questions for example we mentioned the thief on the cross he probably would have been happy to be baptized mm -hmm. if he could have but somebody that can be baptized, but they choose not to be baptized, well, then maybe that's a question that one needs to uh, study out, the importance of baptism. And uh, it is important. And if we can, we want to be baptized. So um, there's sort of a balance to yeah. that question. Yeah, there's two right. sides. Yeah. Just a, a follow-up question on the Bible versions. I forgot to ask this on that question. Uh, why are there some churches where their Bible has more books than, let's say, the, the Protestant Bible, for example? Would you guys want to touch on that? Yeah, a good question. Um, if you look in uh, a Douay version, that's the pretty much the Catholic Bible, you'll have what they call the apocryphal books, and it will have uh, First and Second Maccabees and a number of other intertestamental books. Uh, the Maccabees actually can provide some good history. Uh, most of the Protestant reformers didn't believe that they were inspired or should be part of the canon of Scripture. Uh, one, one thing you'll notice about the books that are include, included in the canon of Scripture is they often cross-endorse each other. Um, but you don't really hear reference or endorsement coming from the New Testament authors for the books of Maccabees or some of these apocryphal, some of them are questionable books. Years later, they suddenly appeared conveniently to prove a church doctrine uh, and they had never been heard of before and so it's very suspicious origin. So uh, um, I think all the books that we have in our Bible today, the, the typical Protestant Bible, uh, these were all accepted within uh, 20 years of the death of the Apostle John. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. Amen. Okay. Referencing Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, uh, where it mentions uh, the, the wicked, or let me just ask the question. Will the wicked rise and see Jesus and will the ones that pierced him 
also rise just to see him and die again. Uh, this is a reference to Revelation 1 7 where it says, Behold, it comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and those also that pierced him. So the question has been asked, well, oh, who is this group of people, the Bible says, who pierced Jesus? They will be resurrected to see Jesus come the second time. So, so the question is, well, when does this happen? Does this happen at the second coming? Does it happen after the 1,000 years? Um, there is a group of Bible or a group of people that would show up in Scripture in the New Testament, um, sometimes referred to as a special resurrection. And these are the ones who were playing a leading role in the trial and the death of Jesus. You'll recall the story where Jesus stood before Caiaphas, the high priest, and there were all kinds of different testimonies, false testimonies that were given concerning Christ, but they couldn't agree. And finally, Jesus didn't say anything. And finally, the high priest said, I adjure thee by the Most High, are you the Christ? And at that point, Jesus could remain silent no longer. And Jesus said, I am. Hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom with power. Um, they would not believe the miracles that Jesus performed or the teachings of Jesus, and yet they still wanted proof. And finally, Jesus said, you will have proof. You will see me coming again. Mm -hmm. So it appears that there will be a group of people, including Caiaphas and maybe those who played a leading role in the crucifixion of Jesus. They are resurrected in response to the question that they asked. Mm -hmm. They wanted proof that Jesus was the Christ they will finally get their question answered. They will see Jesus coming again. It doesn't mean they saved. They destroyed with the rest of the wicked, with the brightness of Christ coming. But they are, they get the answer. They, there's no question after that that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Yeah, I was just going to say with Pastor Jean, that verse for you to go back and take a look at is Matthew chapter, he's quoting, is Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 and 64, which is a really key verse. Mm -hmm. So... And it's interesting, when you look at the items of mockery that they put on Jesus, you know, the crown of thorns, the vesture, and the sign, all of those are going to be shown in their true reality when Jesus comes back. I think it's uh, Revelation 19, where he's going to have a crown of glory, he's going to have a vesture that says King of Kings, and, um, you know, they're going to see him as the true king mm -hmm. and that they mocked. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really kind of a warning for us today that we don't want to mock Jesus either, the way that we live, we can mock him too. So, because um, some of the students were asking, well, is this even really a, a salvational issue, this question? And I think when we look at the deeper meaning of the question, like what I just said about how, you know, we have to decide if we're going to crown Jesus, make him our king, or if we're going to mock him every day of our lives. So I think mm -hmm. it's very relevant to, to look yeah. at. All right, what does it mean to be equally yoked? Do married couples need to be of the same church? What if both are Christians, but members of different churches? Well, this uh, statement of Paul's harkens back to, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, they would farm with animals yoked together. And I think you can understand, it's kind of like if you're rowing a boat and you've only got half of your paddle on one side of the boat and the full oar on the other, you can kind of go in circles. If they yoked an oxen with a donkey, uh, you'd have really crooked furrows, and they'd one be going faster and pulling different ways, and they just don't work well together. And so he's using that analogy of the absurd. Um, when it comes to marriage, you want two people that are going in the same direction. I think uh, Jesus quoting Amos said, can two walk together unless they're agreed? And if you have two people that have different faiths uh, and they get married, especially if they bring children into the relationship, you say, well, how are we going to raise, raise the children? Are we going to raise them Catholic or Protestant? I'm using two extremes here. Uh, that can cause all kinds of problems. So you want to be of the same denomination as well. Matter of fact, most Christian denominations, the pastors will not marry their members to members of another denomination. Not all, but it used to be that way. Amen. We have a question that has come in from our online students here. So I'm just asking this one on the spot. Uh, we found it hard to study with Mormons as they seem to have the Book of Mormon in a higher esteem than the Bible itself. How can we show from the Bible that the Bible is sufficient or even that the Book of Mormon is not of God? 
Well, I think, first of all, if you take an honest look at the Book of Mormon, I've done a little bit of reading and Bible studies with, with Mormons. It doesn't take you very long to realize that the Book of Mormon actually contradicts the Bible in certain points. So if one would show them that, you know, there's some contradictions between the Book of Mormon, it's the teachings of Mormonism with reference to the Bible, I guess the question then comes, well, which of the two books have greater authority? Which one should we follow? And if you compare the prophetic aspects of the Bible, I have, for example, the book of Daniel and Revelation, you compare some of these things with reference to the Book of Mormon, there's no question that the Bible is far superior so first of all, you want to look at which is truly inspired. Well, of course, the Bible is. If you look at prophecies, they all came true. And the Book of Mormon is lacking those type of things. As a matter of fact, there's, you probably heard about some, some ongoing archaeological studies to try and discover these lost cities in North America of these civilized entities that the Book of Mormon talks about that's just really not there. So uh, once again, the Bible and the prophecies of Scripture they help establish the authority of the Bible, and that's an important starting point. Amen. Just uh, kind of building on that, you know, in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you know, uh, Paul's dealing with the issue of speaking in tongues and prophecy. And it's interesting, he gives a principle that you're uh, speaking about in verse 32. He says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So in other words, if this book is of God, then it has to agree with pre-existing revelation. Mm -hmm. And so God has always had his prophets, you know, to communicate his message throughout time. And so if someone's claiming, I think it's important to understand as you were speaking about the tests of a prophet. How do I know what a, a real prophet is like? And then match that with all of these others who claim that they're prophets because they have to, you know, agree with each other. Uh, just kind of like Daniel studied Jeremiah, you know, getting a vision, going back to what Jeremiah had to say, and, and so the prophets are subject to the prophets. And I, I think people can claim to be prophets or claim that they're following a prophet, but it's important to understand what are the identifying marks. Mm -hmm. so, and, and that Scripture was first, way before the Book of Mormon, way before some of these others claimed to be prophets, and, uh, which is a huge point. So yeah. we can start there many times. The, the biggest thing that I've learned with studying with Mormons, I've had a wonderful opportunity of being able to study with quite a few Mormons. And I will say we can learn a lot from our Mormon brothers and sisters because they have a lot of courage. They knock on doors and, you know, they want to study the Bible. And if you're someone who wants to study the Bible and someone comes and knocks on your door, you know, it's, it's an, exci an exciting exchange to get to study with them and to learn from them. And the thing that has helped me the most and my family with studying with them is just showing the, the truth of the Bible and showing that there are some major doctrines in the Bible as far as what happens when you die, mm -hmm. um, things like, the, yeah, the Sabbath. Um, these things are going, you're going to, like you said, you're going to have conflict with them right quick, but you have to know how to keep the study going and not get in an argument with them. And the more that you can show them the beauty of the Scripture then it starts to create questions in their mind. And then it's interesting to look at the development of Mormonism that at the, the, in history, the time period in which it originated and came on the scene was an interesting time prophetically, you know, in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, that Joseph Smith died in 1844. You know, there's all these parallels and interesting things that were going on. And it's also neat to look at some of the things that he said in some of his quotes and uh, I can share some of these quotes with you. I have them on my computer that might be helpful. I wouldn't share them right away, but when the time is right, the Spirit will lead you, and you can show these quotes, things that he said that are very troubling as far as just uh, his mindset. So um, be sweet to them, first off, and be patient and share truth gradually. And I think if you stay in the Word, then Amen. things will be okay. So. Okay, our next question is, should Christian women wear uh, head coverings in church because of 1 Corinthians 11 that says a woman should cover her head when in church? Uh, it doesn't technically say a woman should cover her head in church. I believe it says that a woman, should, when she's praying in public, should cover her head. You know, there, first of all, we get this question uh, probably once every couple months on our Bible Answer program. 
uh, because it seems like a very strong statement that Paul is making. And then you look for other examples in the Bible. You, know, you should never build a doctrine on one verse because something, one word could be misunderstood. There's like one verse in, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, he talks about baptism for the dead. Hmm. And some people, like our Mormon friends, have built a whole doctrine of people getting baptized for the dead based on that one verse where actually they got a comma in the wrong place. Um, the question about women covering their heads, we just have to ask, is Paul talking about a custom then of women covering their heads and not wanting to look like a bad witness? We're all sitting up here wearing ties. Um, <laughs> and there's, you know, I, I can't think of a practical reason other than it's a custom to, of respect to wear a tie. Um, there's no command in the Old Testament that a woman must cover her head. Um, Paul, I think, is saying that, matter of fact, later in that verse, he said, we have no such custom in 1 Corinthians 11. So, you were going to say? I think the bigger principle there is showing respect, and, and that might vary from place to place. Pastor Doug and I, uh, earlier this year, we were actually in India. We went to a, a large Christian church. Pastor Doug was invited to speak there, and there are several thousands of people that go to the church. We found it very interesting. As you enter into the church, there's a whole lot of little cubby holes. Everybody takes their shoes off and they put them in the cubby. As a matter of fact, they asked us to take our shoes off, which we did, to go into the church because there, removing your shoes, entering into the church is a sign of respect. So it would have been wrong for us to say, well, we don't do that in America. We're not going to take our shoes off when we go to church here in India. Um, that's not recognizing uh, something that represents reverence in that culture. And I think that's the point that Paul is referencing here. At the time, in the culture, in the place, that was a sign of re reverence and respect. And if you read the whole context of 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with some of these issues that were in the early Christian church in the church of Corinth. So he's reminding people to do everything decently and in order and recognize these signs of respect that was necessary. Amen. How did animals get to Australia if all land animals outside of the ark were destroyed in the flood? Qantas Airlines. <laughs> uh, I think that before, uh, and this is not technically a Bible question, but, uh, you know, our understanding is being, you know, most uh, creation theologians, that there were land bridges. In fact, you can trace the DNA pretty well now. DNA science is pretty firmly established that America was populated by people that came across the Bering Strait, uh, the Native Americans most closely resemble the people of Mongolia in their DNA. They can trace the animal migrations w before when the, the water levels were lower and they were able to, some of the species were able to come uh, down to a Australia and you had all the different varieties of marsupials that developed there. So there's also been some continental drift that took place and some people believe that's in uh, where is it in Genesis where it says in the days of Peleg the land was divided hmm. and I think you got to be careful not building a whole scientific doctrine out of that but most people agree that there's been tectonic plates that have shifted and Australia was one of the first ones to be separated as the animals were spreading so I've also heard probably you heard about it too with the ice age a uh, number of uh, biblical creationist scholars think that uh, there was a lot of ice immediately following the flood. And it's possible that the ice would have stretched over areas of, of sea now, which allowed migration of certain animals to move across a little easier than now. So that's another explanation for some of what we see. And of course, there are some very isolated places that don't have certain types of animals. I think of New Zealand. I, I like to visit New Zealand because there's no snakes in New Zealand. <laughs> they couldn't make it there. And lots of birds. <laughs> Do you think there's a connection between the girl that was 12 years old and the woman that had the bleeding problem for 12 years? Oh, can I please answer this? <laughs> I do a whole sermon on this. Uh, you can find the story in Mark chapter 5, I believe. And uh, Jesus is on his way to heal the daughter of Jairus. It says she's 12 years old. In route, he's being jostled and pushed on every side. A woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years touches Jesus. She is healed. 
he then gets a message that the girl has died and he tells Darius, don't be afraid, just believe. He comes to her house, he touches her, says she's 12 years old and then uh, she's healed. She comes to life. He says, give her something to eat. Um, I, I believe this is an allegory for how both the economy, a woman is often in prophecy, symbolized as a church, how both the Old Testament and the New Testament church meet their fulfillment in Christ. The Old Testament church had a continual flow of blood, but they were no better but grew worse from the sacrificial system. Uh, it met its end with the death of Christ. The death of Christ raised the new church to life and he rose from the dead and he fed the church for 40 days before his ascension. He kept studying the Bible. He said to the girl, give her something to eat. I, I really think that there might be an allegory in, these, in this one story. It all happens together. You've got 12 and 12. 12 is a symbol for the church. Uh, you got a woman, Revelation 12, 12 stars above her head. So yeah, I think there is something there, but you it's hard to prove. To you don't happen to remember your sermon title for that, do you? A touch of faith. A touch of faith. I okay. think. You probably search on YouTube. It's probably on YouTube. A touch of faith. <laughs> Amen. What should I do when I just don't seem to have enough faith to trust in Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word. Mm -hmm. There are times in every Christian's life or experience where you feel as though uh, you're running on empty. And I think it's those times in our lives where we just have to take God at His word. Uh, we can't look to ourselves. We can't trust in our goodness, but we trust the promise found in Scripture and stake our claim on His word. Jesus overcame the devil by saying, it is written. And of course, that is our defense as well. But you can't overcome with Scripture if you don't first store the Scripture in your heart or in your mind. So that's something that we need to do. But they, you know, the Bible tells us that Christians are to walk by faith, not by sight. I heard somebody once define sight as feeling. As Christians, we are not to walk by our feelings because one day we might feel filled with faith. Other days we might not feel as though we have any faith. But we are to walk by faith in the Word of God, the promises of God, irrespective of how we might feel. Amen. So our confidence isn't in ourselves, but it's in the promise of Jesus. And those promises never fail. You know, I was just thinking of the story we were just talking about of the woman with it, you know, the issue of blood and touching the hem of Christ's garment. She probably could have felt that day that she didn't have enough faith. And I look at this question and I think to myself, sure, we may not have enough, but we still have some. And every man is given a measure of faith. Mm -hmm. And so just like that woman, whatever little bit of faith she had, she stepped forward and uh, the Lord rewarded her greatly for that step of faith. Um, and so there's times we don't feel like we have enough, but it's okay. Um, we have faith. That's the key point. There is a measure that's given to every man, and, and each day we just take one day at a time, mm -hmm. one step at a time, one prayer at a time, one page of the Bible at a time. That's right. And it's, al it's always okay to say, Lord, help my unbelief. Uh, I'm trying to remember where that is. Mark chapter 9. Okay, Mark chapter 9. So, uh, it's definitely okay to say that, and uh, God will help us. You know, He's our Heavenly Father who, who wants to increase our faith. So, okay, in Exodus 16, 29, it states that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Does this text forbid to travel on the Sabbath day locally or overseas? Does this text apply for us today? Well, I believe every word... It applies to us. Um, Exodus 16 is in the context of them going out of their camp to gather bread. And they said there would be no bread on the Sabbath. And so the idea of them going out to gather bread, when he said, abide in your place, I actually heard one pastor I strongly disagree with. He said they weren't supposed to go to church. They were supposed to stay in their tents. Mm. Uh, so no, he's just talking about don't go looking for manna First of all, when they gathered, there would be none if they tried to keep over an extra day the man had bread worms. Um, I, I don't think it's a prohibition that you can't be engaged in any travel on the Sabbath because in Bible times, if you're on a boat that was crossing an ocean, it might have to be in a route on the Sabbath. 
uh, but you should always treat the day uh, respectfully. Um, if you're able to avoid Sabbath travel, we never book, in our family, we never book any travel on the Sabbath. We always try to arrive before sundown, leave after the Sabbath is over. It's just hard to keep the Sabbath in your, if you're in the typical transportation environment. Does that mean you can't get in your car and drive to, you know, visit members that are 50 miles away? That's the effort it once took to travel when you had to hitch up the horses and bounce around on a wagon for 50 miles was a lot different than getting in your uh, cruise control car with air conditioning and pressing a little bit on the accelerator. <laughs> so, you know, it's a principle of work. If you can do some good, um, that kind of travel, I don't think it's wrong to go visit somebody. But I want to be engaged in a, you know, a trip of transportation. Yeah, across the country yeah. or something like that. I appreciate the clarification because I know when we lived in India, sometimes for those that are overseas, um, sometimes that's the only way. The only way I could go preach in Allahabad is if I bought a little ticket and rode the train that day and, and rode it back. But the, the goal of that was to minister, mm -hmm. you know, and, and doing that and, and sharing faith. Um, I think a big point, too, when I look at this question is, you know, it, as Pastor Doug's sharing, it really comes down to the context. And I think that's what we've been sharing here in relationship to the questions is, you know, when you're studying the Bible, you have an immediate context and you have a broad context. And so it's it's important to kind of read the whole context. And we keep going back over that. I just want to emphasize that again, is that yeah. that context is really important as you're studying, you know, yeah. to this to this situation and others. You know, Pastor Doug, I think you have a sermon called Sabbath Disputes or something similar to that. They might want to check that out, too. I think it goes through all the disputes that uh, Jesus was challenged with mm -hmm. with the way that he handled the Sabbath in his day. So that might mm -hmm. be helpful. What do I do if I don't feel that I love Jesus even though I believe in him as my Savior? Now, just the background for this question is we had a student who was sharing with someone one of our presentations, and I think the statement was made, that you can't be a true Christian if you don't love Jesus. And this person said, well, you know, I gave my life to Jesus, but I don't really love him. I accept that he's my Savior, that he saved me from the devil, but I can't say that I love Jesus. And so... Um, I'll, I'll jump in to that. start. I know others may comment. I think it's interesting that Moses, speaking for the Lord, said, I command you this day to love. Now, how many here want someone to command them to love. If your spouse says, I command you, you better love me. Uh, um, now, if you think of love as a feeling, that doesn't work very well. But if love is a choice, and I believe we can choose by our actions to show our belief in God, to love and obey God. Um, and, but there is also the, the emotion, the affection for God, which is another way we think of love. There's, yeah. I think, four or five different words for love in the Bible. Yeah. So I'll stop and let someone else say something. I was going to add to that, the Bible tells us to love our enemies. Mm. There's probably not too many people that have warm, fuzzy feelings towards somebody that's persecuting them. Nevertheless, if love is a choice, we can still choose to not get even. Mm -hmm. or not seek our, our own you know, revenge. Um, so love has this choice component. And I think when we choose to love Jesus, we choose to put him first, uh, we might not necessarily feel that at first, but if we consistently make that choice, it's funny how your feelings catch up with the choice that you make to serve and follow Jesus. So uh, again, it's, it's a growing experience. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us us right. so as we see his love for us that'll awaken a love within our hearts for him seeing that love that pastor jean is talking about you know if we would spend a thoughtful hour each day looking at those last mm -hmm. scenes yeah. of christ's life you know and and the love that he really exhibited to each one of us if we spent time before the cross each and every day as we're encouraged to uh, we'll grow in our love for him uh you ca you cannot you know um, he showed perfect love when he gave his life. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So. That's right. Amen. makes me think of uh, Peter's ladder, I call it, in uh, 
2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, you know, that we have all these uh, precious promises that God has given us. And he says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, which is love. So the more, Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So sometimes I think our love relationship with Jesus may at first be on an intellectual level, but the more time we spend with him, like you're saying, the more we read the Gospels, then I think our hearts will be pricked and we'll fall in love with him. Is the desire of ages just another commentary on the life of Christ, or does it have more authority? If so, why? not really a Bible question, but I would guess that the uh, participants on the platform here would believe that the desire of ages is more than just uh, another commentary if you believe that the author was divinely inspired. And I would say if you wonder about that, read it. Um, I, I read the book Living Up in the Mountains, never been to a Seventh-day Adventist church, and I thought, wow, this, it, it spoke to my heart. Most commentaries are not as moving. You know, in the Library of Congress, a little publishing concept here, in the Library of Congress, there's like 10,000 versions of the life of Christ, different books that have been written on the life of the Christ, but they found Desire of Ages is the one most people like to read. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of volumes on the life of Christ, but I would encourage you to read The Desire of Ages. You'll find what most people have found, mm -hmm. that it's the best one on the life of Christ. Amen. I think when you talk about the book Desire of Ages, it does lead into the question of does God still, in a special way, inspire or guide his people in the last days? Mm -hmm. And we know that the gift of prophecy was something that we see throughout the New Testament era as well as the Old Testament. The Bible does say that before Jesus comes, there will be a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the gift of prophecy will be manifest amongst God's people in the last days. Now, having said that, I think it's also important for us to recognize that in the last days, the devil's also going to have a lot of counterfeits of individuals who claim to be inspired or claim the gift of prophecy. But the Bible tells us that we ought to test the spirits. We have to test by the word of God. So right. anyone claiming to be inspired by God, their testimony must mm -hmm. be in harmony with what the scriptures say. And I, I think it deals with the other question we spoke a little bit earlier about how do you know what inspiration yeah. is. But having said that, we can't deny that the Bible does speak in the last days of a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gift of inspiration once again be f being found amongst God's people. Yeah, it says, you know, in Revelation 12, 17, that the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19, 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And 1 John 4, 1 tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, like you're saying, but try, and that word try means test, mm -hmm. the spirits, whether they be of God. And he says, because there are many false prophets that are going out into the world. So if there are false prophets, Must be there has one. to be true prophets. And then Isaiah 8, 20 tells us, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. So um, just read it like Pastor Doug said. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew 25, 12 says, But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Is this the second resurrection for these people? Verily I say to you, I know you not. Well, I think there's two parts. First of all, you've got, when Jesus comes the second time, you've got two groups who are alive. You have the righteous that are translated and taken to heaven without seeing death, and you have the wicked. And in that day, there will be those who claim to be Christians when Jesus comes, but they will hear the words, I do not know you. Jesus said there are many in the last days who will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out devils in your name, and yet God says, I do not know you. So, that in one sense can refer to the people who are alive when Jesus comes, but there's probably a lot of the wicked that remain in the grave until the end of the thousand years, and we call that the third coming, when the new Jerusalem comes out of heaven and the righteous are there and Jesus is there, and you have the final judgment called the great white throne judgment scene. All the wicked are then resurrected for that final judgment. And at that time, yes, once again, there'll be those who claim to be Christians, claim to be the followers of Christ, 
but it will become very clear that their hearts were not fully surrendered to God. I was, I was just going to build on that. You know, it's it's an interesting passage because it's in the framework of, you know, the second coming. Um, Matthew chapter 24, it's interesting that Jesus at the very end asks the question, who then is wise and faithful? And then he says, blessed is that servant. And then Matthew 25, which is where this is coming from, basically he unlocks the answer to that question in three parables. And so you see this is at his second coming, you know, where specifically he's unlocking, you know, you've got the, the five wise and the five foolish, and then this is what he says to those that are foolish and they don't have oil, you know, enough oil in their lamps. Um, so you kind of see this in relationship to the second coming. It's 25 is the larger context to 24, um, which is. We have a question that has come in on Facebook. Are we predestined to die when God arranges the time for us or do we die because our choice or a careless mistake? Well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, choices that we make can uh, uh, make us die sooner. The Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt the name of the Lord thy God, meaning if you do tempt the Lord and you start you know, playing Russian roulette in some area of your life, you may reap the consequences of that. So uh, the Bible's very clear that don't be deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow, you're going to reap. And uh, you want to do everything you can. You know, if the Lord tarries, we'll probably all eventually get old, sick, and die. But uh, otherwise, you want to do all you can to live as long as you can to serve God and your fellow humans. That's right. Uh, so there's maybe two parts to this. Uh, on one hand, it's our choice. God does not remove from us the freedom to choose. Uh, he's not going to always intervene when we do something reckless, and we're grateful that he has. <laughs> I can think of my own life where God's yeah. protection has been with me. But God will not force someone uh, if they are purposely choosing to do something else. But if we are trusting in the Lord and we are holding on to him, we can have confidence that he will take care of us and his will will be done in our lives. You remember when they tried to persecute Jesus and Jesus said, no, my time has not yet come. And he went about doing the work that he knew his father had purpose for him to do. I think it was one preacher, I forget who it was, who said, uh, I am immortal until my Lord time has come, until my work has been done. Yeah. So if, if we committed to Christ and trusting in him, he will take care of us. But having said that, we don't want to purposely put ourselves in harm's way. Okay. I just said one more thing came to me while you were talking, is that Isaiah the prophet, God sent Isaiah to tell King Hezekiah, set your house in order, you're going to die. Well, it sounded mm -hmm. like he was predestined. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, cried and prayed, and it moved God so much, he told Isaiah, go back and tell him I changed my mind. <laughs> you're going to live another 15 years. So um, the, the idea of predestination, uh, this fatalistic idea that you're, you know, your number's up. And, you know, I do think that God has a destiny for people. Obviously, Christ's life was destined, and there's prophecies about his death. But uh, our, our choices need to be factored in. Yeah, it makes me think of Ecclesiastes seven seventeen, It says, Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why should you die before your time? Mm -hmm. So... That's a good, good yeah. verse. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Facebook. Actually, a couple are coming in here. How do we keep the Sabbath holy? I mean, what are some principles on how to keep the Sabbath? Well, I think if you just start with the Ten Commandments, you look at the Fourth Commandment, it tells us that, that is a day for us to rest, not doing our own secular labor on the Sabbath. It is also a time where we turn our attention to spiritual things. It's an opportunity for us to gather with our like-minded believers and worship God. It's an opportunity for us to build family relationships. It's an opportunity for us to grow closer to God through nature. So there are some, it's a, it's a day to do good. It's a day for ministry, to minister to those who are sick or maybe those who are lonely. Uh, it's a good opportunity for us to set aside our own interests and our own cares and turn our attention upon spiritual things. I remember Pastor Doug, when I was a, a new pastor, I was pastoring in Iowa, and I had three churches, and it was the busiest day of the week for me, running from one church to the other. I preached in all three churches on the Sabbath, two in the morning, one in the afternoon, mm. and then I'd go visit people after that. And I remember driving home one day just totally worn out and very tired, and I thought to myself, well, Lord, this just doesn't seem fair. 
other people are enjoying the Sabbath and I am exhausted by the end of the Sabbath. And I remember being strongly impressed, I think it was the Holy Spirit, where God said, I've asked one day of you to set everything else aside and do just what I'm purposing for you to do. And I realized, well, Lord, I can rest some other day. This day, in a <laughs> special sense, you've asked me to use to be a blessing to others. Amen. So the Sabbath is a day for us to minister and to be a blessing to others. In, in Isaiah 58, you know, we're very familiar with the verse. It says, it would be, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways, uh, from seeking your own pleasure, from speaking your own word, you know, the focus is not on us. Uh, really, the focus is all about him. We, you know, focus on other things during the week mm -hmm. where the Lord says, I, I just want your focus. Um, uh, then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I love the promises that mm -hmm. come along with this. Um, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's some beautiful promises as we focus on him on his holy day. Amen that he will do for us in our lives. That's right. The Sabbath is very special. It's like a present that he wants every family to open because if you look in the world today, people are working 24-7. They don't have time with their family and they're just going, going, going because we have these things. You know, we just stay on these things and these things and social media and we're just so disconnected. But the Sabbath is a time to, like Marshall read there, to delight in the presence of your family, the presence of God. And... Real practical, you know, look at Jesus' example. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. Mm -hmm. And it was his custom, so it was something that he did mm -hmm. regularly. So I think the Sabbath is a beautiful thing, uh, and we have to remember to make it a day of delight for our family, for our children. And it's really something that we all can probably learn how to do better and uh, learn how to look forward to it every week. Amen. So, okay, we kind of... Um, we answered this question if God already knows the end and the beginning of everything and everyone can our destinies be changed I think we've already kind of addressed that pretty good so let's take a look at uh, this question here on the screen what does it mean that judgment will come to the third and fourth generation of those that hate God good question because it tells us in is it Ezekiel 18 that the uh, son will not be punished for the sins of the father or the father for the sins of the son and here it sounds like the children are being punished several generations for the sins of the parents. Uh, I believe what God is saying is that because of the behavior of the parents and their example, they will tend to reproduce in their children the same behavior and the same consequences come. And they've discovered that, you know, in families where there is alcoholism or where there's abuse or drug use that's often reproduced in the children, uh, it's not that God is arbitrarily saying, because the Father did this, I'm going to punish the Son. Yeah. And it's not like God is quick to, or not quick to extend His mercy. I mean, His mercy is right there to, to break this generational curse, if yeah. you want to call it that. And I see your, your mic's hit a few mouths. One second. But, oh, yeah. Maybe you're going to say the same thing I'm going to say. <laughs> in, in the Ten Commandments, when He talks about uh, visiting the iniquity of the Father on the children unto the third and fourth generation of those that hate me. People often stop and ask the question, keep reading. Yeah. It says, and showing mercy unto thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. And that word thousand, that's where you're saying the exact, is actually thousand generations. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing is he's actually saying, sure, to the third and fourth, but I have mercy for thousands of generations. Mm -hmm. And so you see this difference we kind of, like you said, stop at that one point. Yeah. But there's thousands of generations he wants to give mercy to. Amen. How do you practice evangelism and try to win souls for Jesus when you're currently not strong enough yourself? You ever feel that way? The, uh, the Lord said to Peter, and I think this is in Matthew 18, where, uh, where is it, where Peter says, uh, uh, surely, Lord, this won't happen to you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Yeah, Matthew 16. And yeah. there, um, Jesus says, Satan has, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. So here Jesus is saying, 
even though the apostles were not converted, he had already sent them out on evangelistic missions. Uh, they had been out several times during Christ's ministry, preaching and teaching to others. But at the upper room, they're arguing who is the greatest. They don't want to wash each other's feet, and they're denying the Lord. And, and so I believe that you don't have to know everything before you start doing evangelism. Share what you do know. Reaching others, I think, is part of our conversion process. That's right. I've often heard God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And, you know, it says right here, building on that, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I love this. It says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness, or my strength is perfected in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell upon me. Sometimes we want to focus on our strengths when really God says, just acknowledge your weaknesses and I'll make you strong. You yeah, know, it's his strength. The best way you can learn what the Bible has to say and learn the fundamental teachings of the Bible is to share it with somebody else. Yeah, that's right. I remember when I was uh, going through seminary and uh, I thought I had all the answers and I knew all the doctrine. I did a Bible study with this one family and I remember the lady came up with a Bible verse. I didn't know this verse was in the Bible and it totally contradicted everything I was saying. It forced me to go back and study the scriptures and look at that verse and try and figure out how does this fit in with everything. I, I, I went back afterwards and I had an answer for her and I'll never forget the reasoning for why we believe what we believe because it forced me to go back and study it out for mm -hmm. myself. So when you share your faith, they're going to ask questions and you might not have the answer. That's a good thing. It'll mm -hmm. send you back to the Word yeah. so that you can really understand and know what it is that you believe. Amen. Amen. The, the disciples weren't perfect when the Lord sent them out the first time. It was actually quite early yeah. in, in his time with them. But they, they knew coming back who to depend on right. even more. Makes me think of my wife, what you're saying. Uh, she used to work in the pharmacy, and some of her uh, coworkers, they would make fun of her for some of her beliefs. And she, was, she, she mentioned the sheep and the goats one day. And they said, what? The sheep and the goats? That's not in the Bible. And she was like, yes, it is. And like, where? She didn't know. So she went home and she found it. Now she can tell anybody where the sheep and the goats are. <laughs> Matthew 25. She knows right off <laughs> because she had to go back and look at it, you know. So can you explain, our next question is, can you explain the 70 weeks prophecy? In what, three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> You want me to try and do Reader's Digest yeah, you version? Can jump right in there. Uh, the 70 week prophecy is found in Daniel chapter 9, where the angel Gabriel appears to Daniel and he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And this is a prophecy that brings them from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah. And uh, that went from 457 to roughly 34 AD, was when the time period concludes. It said that one week or seven years before 34 A.D. that the Messiah would be anointed. That was 27 A.D. That in the midst of the last seven years, he would cause the sacrifice to cease. Jesus died three and a half years later, the midst of the last week in A.D. 31. The veil in the temple was rent, showing the sacrificial purpose was ended. And uh, it said this much time is cut off for the Jewish nation to introduce the Messiah. At the end of that 70 weeks, Stephen preached to the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, and uh, they as a nation plugged their ears, took him out, and stoned him. He died very much like Jesus. False witnesses, a, a bad trial, prayed for the mercy of those that were killing him. And uh, so this was saying that from that point on, it says in, in uh, Acts chapter 8, at that time a great persecution arose against the people of God and they were scattered everywhere preaching the word. The gospel really began to fan out to the Gentiles and then by the time you get to Acts 10, Peter's preaching to the Cornelius' house and Paul is converted in Acts 9. So you just see the gospel then goes to Jew and Gentile. That's a quick version. And that's a great prophecy to show the reliability of the Bible. Amen. Okay, here's a, uh, and Pastor Ross, did you have anything you wanted to say on that? No, Pastor Doug, you did a good job. Summer. I mean, that, that could be a whole sermon, yeah. one hour, but that's a great <laughs> summary that we have. Well, here's a, here's a real practical question, and Pastor Doug, this one's kind of going t towards you. Um, if you could answer it first, 
um, because I know you've struggled with this early on in your life. It says, why is it that some people are able to stop smoking instantly, whereas for others it's a real struggle? Is that because of a lack of faith? You know, I think the Lord knows what we need. Um, I've, we probably all have known people that have been dramatically um, delivered. I mean, Paul was converted through a vision on the road to Damascus. Uh, other people, it's through a long study of the Word. Um, you know, God reaches us differently. And I've seen people that they, they just really needed a miracle of deliverance for them to have faith in the Lord. And God just took away the desire for smoking. Uh, you know, and I just, I can think of several people. They were just struggling and God just took it away. And they said, I can't believe it. I have no desire. And they never smoked again. For me and many others, I was just days and weeks of wrestling with the desire and the urge and the temptation and gradually it subsides and it goes away. So it's that way with many temptations. Some of you heard my sermon on my addiction to ice cream <laughs> called Cold <laughs> Confession. That took years. <laughs> that was harder than tobacco. <laughs> so the question is, that do I have a lack of faith? Because someone might suddenly gain the victory over something and uh, to me it takes a little bit of struggle. No, I think all of us have those areas of our lives that yeah. require earnest prayer yeah. and an exercising of our faith. For one person it might be one area, but for us it might be a different area. And so recognizing that God wants to lead us and he leads us step by step, but it does require at times a wrestling. I'm reminded of a quote in the book Steps to Christ. It says, the greatest battle that is to be fought is the surrender of self. Mm -hmm. It requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. For each one of us, that surrender of self might be a little different, but there is that struggle where we need to let ourselves submit to the will of God. And in some cases, like in this, it might be good to get an accountability partner, mm -hmm. someone that you can trust, where anytime you have the desire, you can call them and say, hey, I'm having the desire. Would you pray mm -hmm. with me right now? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, like you said, faith comes by hearing, by hearing the Word of God. And so the more Bible verses that you put in your mind, and when you feel that urge to want to smoke or any other sin for that matter, start reciting, and this may sound elementary, but start reciting Bible verses out loud if you're in an area where you can, and just start reciting as many as you can, and you'll find that by the time you're finished, that urge more than likely will have went away. And so there really is power in the Word. And um, there's a lot of good resources online, too, for how to stop smoking. So I'll, I'll uh, follow up with some of the students on this question and try to help them if they know a friend who's struggling with this. Let's see, we've got maybe time for one, two more. We'll see. One more question? Yeah. Um, when it comes to witnessing, what does it mean to not cast your pearl before swine? You want to go ahead. Um, you you want to be very careful about where to apply this, but Jesus, you have to remember, was dogged by spies and enemies that kept trying to trap him. And they had no intention of listening to him or being converted. We can't read people's hearts, but sometimes the devil has people that will distract you and take all of your time, and they they really have no intention of hungering for the truth and wanting to change. Again, you want to be very careful about, you know, uh, making those judgment calls. But sometimes there are people that they just want to argue with you. And you've got to say, your life is made of time. It's precious. And it, God doesn't want us to squander that precious resource of study with someone that really is just wanting to hear themselves talk. They don't have an interest in the truth and having a change of heart. And, you know, if you're you're plowing in ground that's just not, it's rocky ground, you're not going to get anywhere. Don't cast your pearls before swine or give that which is holy to the dogs. Go somewhere where you're going to be fruitful. Invest your time in people that really are interested. Again, you, you would hate to ever point to someone and say, that's casting my pearls towards swine. But yeah. I think we all know we have to make those calls all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it's uh, saying, well, this person's not going to be saved. I'm not going to waste my time with them. I think the reality, as Pastor Doug says, is we want to maximize every opportunity that we have. Maybe we're not the one that's going to ultimately reach this person, but I only have so much time. Let me use that as wisely as I can. So find those who are receptive, those who are hungry to learn, 
and uh, invest your time there so that mm-hmm. you can have results. Because the devil's going to do everything he can to try and distract us and keep us busy with other stuff yeah. versus doing what, you know, he's going to make the most difference for the kingdom. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for questions. I do want to say to our students watching that I have been truly blessed reading your comments, your answers to the daily reading material and uh, your testimony videos and seeing you recite your memory verses. It's been really amazing getting to interact with all of you. I want to encourage you to keep going. We're going to unlock week five tonight on friendship evangelism, and I just can't wait to study it with you. So God bless. And uh, Pastor Ross, why don't you close us with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to just talk a little bit about your word this afternoon. Indeed, it is a treasure trove of truth. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about how we can not only learn more ourselves, but also learn how to share it with others, I pray your special blessing. Be with our AFCO students who are going through our AFCO course Father, we pray that you give them opportunities, set up those divine appointments where they can indeed share these mm-hmm. precious truths. But more than anything else, we ask that we would be faithful ambassadors for the kingdom in everything we do and say. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.